I thank Gaurav Chawla, who is the expert here, that who has collated all those applications used for, for use for COVID resources and all. So he has made a very wonderful website that where you can access and get the support during this crisis. Welcome him on board, and today we'll hear who he is helping with the technology and all to the people, those who are living in the remote areas, not uh, having the access of healthcare system. So, and all. after that, we will discuss with. Dr. Khurshid Alam, who is the former health commissioner of England, who is of India origin, and he is already here to share his experiences, what he has done being a public health expert in England, and how he covered all those issues and handling being an officer in office, being there, and how he handled those, and how he sees India's situation in, in terms of COVID, that it is completely devastated, like a catastrophic in India. So we'll hear him for 10 to 15 minutes. Soon after that, we'll take doctors on board, doctors, those who are here, young doctors, they will take the they will talk about the situation in India, about the hospitals, about the healthcare system, and take some of the patients live discussion with them and do the consultation so they can help those patients to get to the remedies and their suggestion on the medicines as well. Soon after that, we will have uh, Dr. Ariel. Dr. Ariel is a very renowned speaker based in Geneva and she runs uh, her, her organization which also have the ECOSOC uh, status uh, with the United Nations and she works across the globe and she is with us and she will be sharing her thoughts. She will be guiding us that how to take it forward and she, uh, she will be giving the Closing remark at the end. So now we begin, and I'll, I'll request Gora Chawla to take up here because I want to hear from you. Like we being in India and using the technology uh, for this COVID, in this COVID crisis, how you are handling? It? How did you make it? And can you tell that how it is beneficial for the people in India, especially the countries where there are a lack of healthcare system, lack of resources, and their uh, the situation is not that that much good that people can afford the high-end support system in this crisis. Mr. Gora Chawla, I'll just uh, request you to just uh, have your uh, presentation 10 to 15 minutes max. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Siddiqui. Uh, it's uh, nice that I'm here uh, today with you. And uh, I will just share, uh, you know, some small insights. Um, the intent is not to, uh, you know, give theories about it, but uh, practically what is possible on the ground. So a brief introduction of mine, uh, so as to set the context. I'm basically a technologist, like you mentioned. Uh, I'm based uh, currently in New Delhi, uh, although I've worked across the world uh, in various capacities um, for some of the largest uh, firms in the area of uh, digital transformation, where we try to make a difference to various industries uh, by bringing in technology. So. Um, you know, on a personal front, however, the reason why I'm here today is because uh, we got very badly hit by the COVID crisis, the resurgence of COVID, which is the second wave in India. And it caught us off guard in a way that we had never imagined. So uh, what we realized and what we saw and people came forward to come and support uh, various initiatives. Um, while I was part of uh, various support groups and, uh, you know, uh, trying to help people in my immediate circle, I realized that there was a need for uh, information to be more widely available. Now, when I say widely available, uh, you know, there is a lot of resources that you have available on WhatsApp forwards or links to websites or various uh, portals uh, or any other lists or trackers that people have created. But there is no one place where you can uh, consolidate them and get a perspective of what all is out there. So I uh, on my personal uh, capacity, I try to help uh, bridge that gap. We try to uh, bring across uh, technology to solve this uh, very real problem that we have. So um, whilst uh, people have come forward, people have come forward to help their fellow uh, citizens and brothers and sisters, uh, early part of the pandemic, nobody, uh, or the second wave of the pandemic, uh, we didn't have resources available or we did not know where to take people. The hospitals were full, the ICO beds were overflowing, there was no oxygen, there was lack of critical uh, drugs, which supposedly uh, addressed the problem. There is still 
a conversation around it, whether those uh, drugs help us or not, but there was a drastic shortage, which is to be expected because of the scale uh, with which uh, the second wave hit India. So I, I think that's the background on why we tried to put together an information portal that brought together all these resources uh, with verified availability of hospital beds, oxygen, medicines, testing services, even doctors on call, which I think is the topic today. So uh, I, I'll take it from here, Dr. Siddiqui. I, uh, that was my answer to your question. So uh, should I proceed and talk further about this or did you have any uh, yes, particular yes. questions in mind? Okay, no, please proceed. We can take a question at the end. Okay. So um, that's basically the reason why I'm here today. And uh, talking about the second wave of the COVID, uh, the disaster it has wrought on urban India has been played out and it is playing out as we speak. Uh, but the resurgence of the second wave, which is now going to hit rural India, that is more worrisome because yes, uh, we do lack critical infrastructure when it comes to a vast country like India. Uh, but uh, the silver lining is that uh, we have access to information technology today. Uh, and I will come to that in a second when I talk about information technology. Plus, we have also the learning of what we saw uh, in the cities, how it played out. And we can use uh, some thoughts from there, some learnings from there, um, and apply that to uh, the you know the rural context as well. And thirdly, uh, we also have the help of our global uh, you know citizens, doctors from across the world who are stepping in, governments from other countries, they're stepping forward to help uh, uh, the country in this time of need. Now. Information technology is a crucial difference from where we were 10 years back. Had this pandemic hit us 10 years ago, you cannot imagine the kind of devastation it, was, it would have caused, way beyond what it does right now or what it has done so far. Uh, information technology means that every person in every corner of the country is today connected with cell phones, with internet connections, so much so that uh, you know, in the remotest of village, you will have at least a few people with a smartphone connection, which can help you get information across information back in, you can do video calling, you can do audio calling, you can exchange crucial pieces of information, all of which are, I would say, very, very important for uh, telemedicine to work. And that is a big change that we see. So it's a good thing that we are prepared to some extent when it comes to exchanging information uh, within the large cities and the rest of the world with the rural hinterland of the country. Now, that will probably not solve uh, our problem of limited infrastructure, less number of doctors, less number of hospitals. But at least, uh, to some extent, we will be able to get some of the knowledge in what medicines to take, uh, remote consultation with doctors, and access to information like what worked, what did not work what to do next in a certain situation. So I think um, that's where information technology tools that I say, today we have 34% of Indian population connected on the mobile internet. 34% for a population the size of India is a huge number, which means one in every third person has mobile internet, which means in every family, there would be at least a device or two so that information can reach them uh, they can consult with doctors, they can consult with information sources, get access to the right drugs uh, and what needs to be done in a certain situation. So that really uh, is a big change. And I think that is something that uh, we should try and leverage to the fullest. Um, that is one aspect. Access to information is one aspect that I spoke about. The second aspect is uh, that for telemedicine to work also, uh, there are some best practices that I'm sure my uh, colleagues and all the renowned doctors who are here today with us, they will discuss in detail. Um, I just wanted to make a few perspectives from uh, a technology angle, uh, an enabler uh, angle. Um, these would not be uh, suggestions, but these would just be uh, a layperson's observation, if you may. And please indulge me in that. Um, so 
I do believe that uh, remote uh, medicine will work, and it has worked because I've seen it firsthand. In our extended circle itself, there were so many people in the family, my friends who were in hospital, some of who, whom were in home isolation, and they had different uh, problems. Each symptom was different. This di this disease is very unpredictable. So the access to a doctor on the phone itself is a big, big boon. And I'm speaking from experience uh, because I have actually seen people ask uh, for a doctor on the phone and that doctor has been able to actually take the person from a very bad situation back to fullest of health. And I have seen that happen. And that is why I'm a strong believer that uh, uh, telemedicine will work, especially in this current situation. Uh, now, given that our own medical infrastructure is limited, the number of doctors we have in the country is limited. Today, we can borrow a page from what uh, the Indian IT services companies had pioneered. The concept of globalization, that work can be done from anywhere. So if you can make software in India and export it to anywhere in the world, and you can use modern communication platforms like Zoom, such as ourselves today, uh, we can very much use that for telemedicine in a very, very uh, effective way. Uh, so if you have people with access, you have an, a skilled doctor or anybody who dials in from anywhere in the world, just see the amount of resources we will have at our command. So it will be a force multiplier. The number of doctors that you have access to and the quality of doctors that you will have access to from all over the world, the best doctors in the world, they are ready to out, ready to help India, which we see today. Uh, this this can make uh, this adoption of technology will make this happen. Um, a few practical aspects: there are um, some uh, suggestions, maybe uh, if I may, that uh, before the global doctors consult with the, the patients in India, there are they will have need for interpreters at times because we are a, a vast country and uh, it to facilitate the communication, often to translate, uh, there will be need for an intermediary to help uh, communicate with the people who have different levels of education uh, in the rural hinterland. That would be one. The second I would suggest is that before, uh, you know, the global doctors, they connect with this, they can consult with the local physicians to understand uh, the flavor. The local flavor of the disease, also the the local brand names of medicines that are commonly available, you know those sort of practical things which only a local doctor would know. That information, if it is available in a small info pack or in a small telecon conversation before uh, the actual consultation happens, that will help uh, these doctors, global doctors, to you know make the maximum of their time in helping people uh, in India. Uh, the third point I wanted to say is that um, the benefits of uh, this technology is clear to all. Uh, the mechanism that we want to drive, uh, I think we could even do uh, something which involves a shadowing, uh, wherein a local doctor consults and uh, a global doctor uh, follows his lead by listening in on the call to understand uh, the sort of symptoms, the sort of conversations, the doctor-patient dynamics before they go uh, whole hog and uh, manage uh, uh, the rural uh, patients. I think those are a few suggestions. Uh, as a sort of conclusive remark, what I would say is that uh, we could even do one-to-one -one consultations or we could even do one-to-many consultations. Technology is available like today we are having a one-to-many conversation. Uh, for not so critical cases, a one-to-many communication will work. Uh, and you can address the doubts and questions of people with mild symptoms. Whereas more critical patients, you can have a one-on-one -on -one consultation subsequent to uh, a one-to-many interaction. Um, and uh, that is something that uh, would help as well. Uh, now, uh, while we will talk about what uh, is, is how it, this might be rolled out, uh, the model of remote uh, doctors on consultation. Uh, I think uh, our country is very grateful 
if uh, global doctors can help us in this time of need. And considering that this could, this pandemic can actually teach us a way in which uh, we can operationalize this model. This might change the model of medicine, the way medicine is delivered or medical consultation is delivered worldwide. And hope, hopefully someday we might be able to return the favor. If there is another uh, crisis anywhere in the world, Indian doctors can return that favor. So I think uh, that that's something that I'd like to uh, present uh, to everyone here uh, from a technology, a healthcare, and uh, a nation's perspective. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sangha. This was very insightful. But uh, one thing I wanted to know that as you, uh, you know that Indian uh, rural India is really very in the bandwidth and the people uh, people they are suffering in the rural area and this is the crisis that what we are seeing and all the technology and the internet activity whatever it is happening mostly concentrated in the urban area how this is going to help us we are struggling we are connecting the whatsapp the social media platforms to reach to the people and mm -hmm. the medicine is also intervening but that is all dependent on the internet so how we are going to overcome that challenge in this crisis you know only you as you gave the data it's like People are connected to the mobile, but not uh, with the internet or that kind of facility. So that is the scenario and the real situation is that. So how we can overcome those gaps, you know, and bridge those gaps, you know, to reach uh, to, the, uh, to the masses and help them through the technology. Okay. Very valid question. And I'm sure uh, uh, we do not have any uh, false perceptions about uh, the quality of bandwidth, uh, which is available in rural areas. So. There are multiple ways to look at it. Uh, you know, one is that let us not expect uh, the full blown video quality that we see today when we are talking to each other in based in cities. Uh, the intent of a video is probably to give comfort to a patient, right? So we will have to look at a hybrid mechanism wherein maybe an initial part of the conversation happens on video just so that the doctor can visually uh, make out what the condition of the patient is. And then you shut down the video and talk. And if even if talk is not possible, the mobile internet, even if the bandwidth is restricted, it is possible to exchange data in different ways. You know, uh, as a voice uh, memo on WhatsApp for the very uh, least educated and uh, people with limited bandwidth. So uh, I'm actually drawn to the fact uh, that 15 or 20 years back when the mobile revolution was still starting in the cities also we used to have very limited bandwidth and we were just starting to experience the internet on the phone but we were finding ways and means to overcome that and we still got access to the information we needed on our phones so i know that our country is very very uh, how shall i say uh, creative when it comes to making the most of limited resources and we we can actually teach people a thing or two so I, I'm not looking at it as a sort of a full blown experience of visiting a doctor uh, with full bandwidth connectivity, but we can look at alternatives that make do and do the get the job done. Yeah, we got your point, uh, Gaurav Chawla. It is very insightful and we can just take another perspective that the person Indian origin, Khosid Alam, he was also a former health commissioner in England. So he is also here and he knows the, both the perspective that uh, being Indian and stayed and worked in England in the health sector. So I'd like to welcome him uh, and just ask him that how do you, he see he sees this scenario and how we can overcome this kind of situation, especially in this uh, country where they, they, even the building was also very badly hit before India, that it was like civil situation there as well, how they overcome and how, what are the learnings that he can share with us. Dr. Khushid Alam, this, I request you to just uh, give your insights. A very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I, maybe it is a different uh, hours in different countries. So a good greetings. Uh, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes indeed. Yes, sir. yes, yes, everybody can hear. Please go. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So, um, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to uh, be sharing my thoughts and uh, also 
hoping to learn something new as well from uh, uh, sharing our ideas. Uh, there are many learned, distinguished uh, guests here. So, what has, um, from putting into perspective with uh, what happened in the, U in the UK and other parts of Western world, uh, we had this struggle, big struggle, in spite of having a very good uh, healthcare, means one of the best healthcare system that exists in the uh, UK as a national health services. But in spite of that, we had a big challenge, especially in the second wave. It's just, just went in the winter. So what we uh, can see from knowing what I know about India and my interaction with India is that we, uh, of course, it's a bit late to say that we did not plan and we did not prepare ourselves. That was uh, very evident from what is happening uh, and why. So, of course, you know, there's uh, no point uh, just going on about spilled milk. So what we can do in the situation? Well, my area is of uh, public health, so preventative medicine. And if anything, one can say uh, is most useful and most important in, in fight against this pandemic is preventative medicine, which is true for all that uh, kind of uh, health issues. But Certainly, in this pandemic, the preventative medicine, uh, preventative uh, format is the most important and the most relevant. That is because, of course, there are doctors who will be talking about you know, treating patients and, and how to see the fatalities, the casualties are minimized. But in terms of preventative medicine, I would say that having just heard from uh, Mr. Gaurav Chawla, if I remember correctly his name, our first speaker, very good, insightful. Um, so we were talking about this, how to reach, um, uh, how, how, how to, to benefit the people in the rural area. And rural India in India is uh, is real rural, and uh, so for that, I think uh, preventative medicine has has a very big role to play. However, in the now we are in the midst of crisis. What uh, I would like to share is that um, again picking up the point from. Uh, Dr. Shahid Siddiqui have about the you know the quality of bandwidth or the non-availability of the you know uh, this services that we all now interacting with. Uh, it is uh, you know the number was 34 percent was right, but then in rural area I don't know whether it is even five percent there or not. And even if it's there, whether connectivity is there or not. So that makes it a big, big huge challenge. Uh, what has been our, um, we have shared, we have uh, some problem, not up to this scale, we had problems in reaching out in the rural area. And what proved the most effective? So I'll go straight with the solution uh, aspect was forming chain of volunteers. The chain of volunteers from across all fields, whoever can volunteer. Uh, there could be students, there could be, um, you know, retired people, but in good health. Uh, there are people uh, who are, you know, have time in their hands and they are, they are dedicated, they want to do something for the community and for the nation. So very important thing is to form a big, for, especially for the size 
like India, you need a huge pool of volunteers. Now these volunteers, I, there are, from my knowledge, there are a lot of volunteering work going on in terms of not only in getting patient to hospital or and then wherever there has been casualty you know then taking care of the bereavement and taking care of uh, eh, cremation or burying the bodies but that is one aspect and we should try and see that is as much as possible, the casualty as minimum, both with our medicine and prayers. But how we support the rural area, this is where I feel the volunteering system would be very effective, provided we have a good pool of dedicated volunteer who will be put, who would be coordinated and there should be satellite centers. So satellite centers should be chosen as per where there are facilities, there are, it has been tested and tried that you can get the connectivity well. And that particular, uh, say there are uh, in one state, there may be hundreds of satellite centers, but uh, oh, one satellite center will cover in their region of uh, say about 20 kilometers radius for the villages falling 25 20 30 depending on the scenario on the on the ground but these satellite centers that's where there will be a doctor will be uh, based as well as other paramedics will be based and and there will be even larger number of volunteers will be based. These volunteers not necessarily are have any medical background or anything. But what is important is that they are not left even to wander around just. They would have to attend a two days of, of training in an order in which they can act effectively and they will sort of work as a, like a, you know, um, go in between the patient in the rural area uh, or whoever needs the help. And if they don't have the connectivity with the uh, telemedicine, then they would go gather the first-hand information and quickly return to the satellite center base. And where quickly it will be assessed by a paramedic or, or a doctor, depending on what, how much resources we have in the satellite center. And depending on that condition, same people, they would, they will have uh, bulk of generic medicine as well as some, uh, some uh, such means what important uh, medicine. However, it will be most generally will be very generic and very basic medicine. So these volunteers would then ferry back to the patient with the appropriate, you know, uh, in, uh, medicine and whatever else is needed, the guidance given by the doctors or paramedics. And then they will be a dedicated care, uh, care worker for that number of patients. Say they, that one volunteer is looking after what, say, hundred people in the in that area, or another volunteer is looking after. So these numbers can be anything. It can be twenty to fifty, depending on how many they can manage. So that nobody is left out. At the same time. These volunteers can also be very importantly used. Those who are not um, uh, kind of involved in uh, very direct, those uh, helping the people who are already suffering, say, from COVID-like symptoms, the others, uh, the, the other team of volunteers will be 
making people aware about preventative medicine. What? It's about taking precautions. I am sure that still in our vast country like India, there is a lot of, a lot of unaware, uh, lack of awareness about the seriousness of this pandemic or even total lack of awareness in terms of to expect that some people don't believe there is a pandemic. They, so we need to at the same time make them aware. So a team of people whose role will be to make people aware. So they will go out. Of course, they will be trained in those two days training a separate kind of training where, which will be work on the awareness. So we have to same time treat one at the same time, we have to prevent other people getting more infected, people getting infected. So these volunteers, who, their duties will be go out, give to those who are, you know, uh, uh, well and fit, get them in a area where they can have a safely managed distance in open air in open their facility because in indoor the risk of you know transmission increases uh, by 7.5 percent more so we need to have like uh, what they call chopal in villages in india that word if uh, am i correct dr uh chopal type thing where people gather around when there's some meeting takes place but they have to be very so, uh, clear about social distancing, about, you know, wearing of masks, about washing their hands or using disinfectant. So the people, these volunteers not only will um, teach them, try and make them aware how important it is to, you know, maintain social distance, how important it is to wear masks and how important it is same time to uh, wash their hands properly for 20 seconds. And there is a proper way in which it has to be washed. It's not like 20 seconds you spend in, as people just think they have rinsed their hand. It is not good. There has to be, a, as I'm saying, it's very basic thing, but it is like you have to do so this volunteering team will be one one team will be working on the preventative side and making sure that the people are understanding the need for the and understand the gravity and serious seriousness of this pandemic and how they should prevent and how they should even on the first sign of something, start isolating themselves within the whatever possibility in the household is there. And the other team, that will be the one who will fill, fill in the gap about where the connectivity is not possible and also where people cannot be reached. Just even if they get the connectivity, what about getting the medication? There are the villages, I have been told, I have been involved in this telemedicine. People don't have basic paracetamol. Now, so Dr. this... Uh, Dr. Kushi, the, you know, there are a few doctors also, they are they want to share. I'd like yeah. to ask you again in the middle because they want to just add some values here. and Definitely, definitely. If, sorry if I have gone over the time. So yeah, I so, just said that these people will not only have telemedicine, they need to have the, uh, those, uh, you know, commonly used medica medication kit. So that they will take, the volunteers will take and deliver and then they will monitor them as well. That's yeah. If the situation getting worse, what facilities, how they can be brought to a, a, a facilities which are wherever the nearest hospital is. Yeah. So okay. with that, I will... Uh, in my, I hope that will be something useful if the 
thank you so much thank you so much dr goshir it's very insightful and very well experienced that you, what you have seen we are also witnessing the same here and now i like to do had because uh, we want to have some more questions and answers and there are young doctors also there are many texting in the box you know with the suggestion i would like to ask few young doctors who they want to share uh, one minute or so two minutes they are very good suggestions they are giving that what are the lackings in the rural areas like dr rachita and dr you know asthana we have already mentioned in the chat box so they would like to add if they want they can come in and ask the question or share the information otherwise i will dr ariel king that she is from geneva and she has worked with the who and she is very well connected in with the red cross societies and uh, rotary club and lots of uh, other humanitarian organizations she has been engaged with and she is in public health experts and working in the health sector so i request dr ariel what how do you see that being uh, uh, connected with the who they are prime institution working uh, this kind of crisis and you are also dealing with that and you are also thinking about the indian situation we have published one report very recently on that how do you see being an outsider and about the india how this india will overcome this situation how soon and how efficiently it can uh, tackle this situation dr ariala yes thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this forum with all of you who are not just public health experts but also all of you who are dealing with this in your own families with your friends or yourself um with this uh covid uh virus so first i'd like to say that i think in general um the way that i see the indian population handling this is actually with a lot of ingenuity a lot of courage resilience um I really am stunned by the amount of people helping each other trying to figure out how to get it done. I I think that the people in Indian society are really working together to try to make this issue better. Now, I as an international public health expert um for many years including working with what used to be called uh, HCLV3 which was HIV and AIDS 30 years ago i believe that the covid-19 the way that people are taking responsibility is very good but i also believe that those who have the possibility to do something about public spaces public health um need to do so i think now it has been seen by many scientists that the covid virus itself um not just goes from person to person but is actually an aerosol droplets within the air which mean that this is something that us as individuals can't really do something about but those in the public health arena can do something about so as while i would say to those that are wearing mask and washing hands as uh, dr kirshen said i think it's excellent i think it's really important. i think it's also important for those of us who have the possibility to um help with ventilation within the air for uh perhaps scientists looking at what we can actually put in the air to actually um if not kill the virus at least try to um uh, stop it from spreading because it's through aerosols and so i think that while we're looking at individuals i'd also like to say to individuals and to families who have experienced this this is not your fault and this is not something that you did wrong uh this is not because you were careless or you didn't wash your hands properly or there was one time when you took down your mask to drink some tea i just want all of you to know and understand that this is a collective problem not just in india but all over the world and that not one single person is responsible for this um public health disease the public disease I think also just very quickly I'd like to say that what we see happening in India now and I'd like you all to know that my first time in India was in 1982 so even though I speak as an outsider I have had the privilege and um the wonderful life journey of being in India many times and having a good number of people that I'm connected to so I've been maybe to India five or six times um, not as a tourist but living with Indian families uh, since 1982 so what i see happening in india is quite um heartening because i see people helping each other and trying to figure out how to make something out of nothing i also want to say that um i believe that hospitals can help but i believe that people uh, including with uh, what dr um chawla was putting together have to help each other so communities rural communities 
others have to band together and figure out how to help each other, how to help each other through it, how to share whatever you have. If you have medications that others don't have, for example, paracetamol, then to please share that. And I want everybody to understand. I'm, I'm not going to do the medical stuff I could, but I think that all of you, um, we have uh, young doctors here that I'd like to go to. I'd like you to understand that th what's happening in India does not stop in India, that it affects the world. And the way that India actually handles this, then the way that India comes through this, because it's a process, the world also will learn from all of you. It is not going to stop in India. Most likely the second and third wave will happen in other countries too. And I want to let you all know that you're not alone. And most importantly, that we really honor what you do and how you, um, how you have all lived throughout your own uh, experiences with COVID there, um, that we will learn from you and that we will implement what you do and how you do it better in other countries in the international public health arena. So I'd like to stop there because I also think that it's really important for young people to speak. It's really important for those who have been affected by COVID or infected by COVID because families have been affected to have the chance to speak and to say what they'd like to say. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Ariella. And uh, we'll take you again uh, at the end for the closing remarks. And in the meanwhile, I'll just take one question that somebody has from Shirisha Reddy from uh, Telangana State. She's asking about that, uh, what are the precautions to be taken in for the COVID third wave that we are talking about, we are into second wave, we are afraid about the third wave. And she is asking that how we can be ready for to face this third wave. What are the general uh, precautionary measures that if you can suggest then they can understand in a, as a, uh, from the public health point of view. Thank you. Is that, is that question being, um, is that for me or for physicians? Yeah, yeah. You can also answer, but uh, I, it's open for anybody that who wants to, because there are many oh, doctors okay. here. Okay. I will quickly say, I think it's really important for us to get a quick understanding of the way that this virus goes around, um, including the fact that it's in aerosols. I think that the fact that scientists have finally, including the World Health Organization, has made it clear that it's not necessarily from person to person, but within the air, within the small particles in the air, I think it's really important. Uh, that we share this um, information with young people, with also children who are quite stressed about what's going on. They see a lot happening and they don't understand what to do. They don't understand what they can do to make life better. And also uh, for young people, that people should understand that this is a collective action and a collective uh, response. This is not just an individual's fault or an individual's responsibility. This is a collective responsibility for all of us. Thank you, Dr. Ariella. And uh, I'll just take one because I want to uh, change the pattern that we are talking about lots of uh, from the expert point of view. I just want to take one youngster who has been infected with the COVID virus. I want to hear from him. How did he recover? What are the measures that he took? And how the people can, uh, by his learning, uh, being a COVID patient and he recovered from that situation. Uh, Sharad, Sharad, are you there? Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. You were infected. How did you? Uh, what? How? How much time it uh, uh, it took to be a normal person like before? And what were the situation? How did you get the healthcare service at the local level? Okay, sir. Uh, firstly, after infecting with the COVID virus, I went to the government hospital here in Telangana, sir. Then after they given me a medical kit. Then uh, for the 14 days, I was in a home isolation and uh, using the medication. The exact medication, what are the government hospitals are giving to me. So with the home isolation, I used that medicines and taken a proper food. And also taken uh, steam for, uh, three times a day. Heat steam for three times a day. And uh, I have uh, taken a good protein diet, sir. So uh, for the 14 days, I have taken the same thing, sir. Now I'm all right, sir. Today is the 25th day of my COVID infection. So again, I tested for the COVID test, but it showed me negative, sir. Food system you got from the government hospitals, are, uh, uh, that was very easy to take the services or it was a struggle for you to get the bed in hospital or get the service and support from the doctor in the hospital? No, no, sir. Actually, uh, it was very easy, sir. When I went to the hospital, 
I just met met the nurse and uh, tested positive. She they they already taken they immediately taken me to the doctor and they provided me medical kit, sir, which consists of sixteen uh, tablets per day. Like okay. uh, from morning eight tablets and uh, evening eight tablets, sir. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you, Sharad. I have uh, I have another perspective of different state. Nayan, Nayan, uh, I was talking to one of our uh, youngster, Nayan Das. Assam. He was telling that you know that when there is a wave of COVID in this country, other patients are suffering because they are not taking the other patients, those who are in urgent situation or in a crisis situation. So they are dying their own death. Even they are not COVID, but they are not having that kind of treatment. Nayan, Nayan, can you explain that scenario that one the patient that you were talking about, Nayan? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, in, uh, yeah, in, uh, in Assam, uh, uh, इस तरह का हो रहा है कि uh, अगर पेशेंट को दूसरा बीमारी भी होता है ना तो डॉक्टर uh, लोग दूसरे बीमारी uh, का चेक करने से डरते हैं आजकल तो इस वजह okay. से पेशेंट्स आफ्टर एवरी टू लाइन आई विल ट्रांसलेट बिकॉज मेनी पीपल दो अंडरस्टैंड हिंदी सो लेट ही इज टेलिंग दैट ड्यू टू covid scenario and the covid crisis in india the doctors and the hospitals are not taking the other uh, patients which is those who are not suffering from the covid so this is another crisis after crisis we are going to witness yeah nayan sir uh, is wajah se uh, patient uh, dusre bimariyon se jhuj ke hi uh, mar rahe hai sir okay aur kya hai ye kiski baar kiski maut hui thi aapne bataya tha jo आ, मेरे गांव के के पास एक अंकल का हुआ आ, पिछले वीक में हुआ है क्या हुआ था आ, किडनी का प्रॉब्लम था डायलिसिस कर रहा था तो डॉक्टर ने अभी डायलिसिस करने को मना कर दिया ओके सो ही डाइड ड्यू टू लैक ऑफ सो ही टेलिंग दैट इन हिज नेबरहुड देयर वाज अ पेशेंट हुआ सफरिंग विद द किडनी प्रॉब्लम ही वॉज गोइंग ऑन द डायलिसिस एवरी डे एंड द डॉक्टर स्टॉप Uh, doing the dialysis and they didn't give him the support in the hospital to do the dialysis due to lack of the dialysis and due to uh, non accessible accessibility of healthcare system he died two days ago due to uh, lack of healthcare system and uh, not accept uh, I mean, like uh, not accepting the other patient uh, in this covid crisis so it's like a situation this is the, the another situation we can see here that you know when you are tackling with the emergency situation with the covid type of situation how you are prepared to tackle other existing crisis which is already there in the uh, in the country that you know there are many situations there where the patients are suffering with the heart disease kidney disease and mental disease lots of diseases are uh, and when you stop taking those patients due to uh, due to uh, covid uh, emergency situation then then how Okay, the, how those patient patient will uh, survive? So that is the another question that where uh, how the things will be handled. So it's very scary and very very you know uh, uh, difficult situation for the healthcare system and all. So now I will take uh, one of our very young uh, Dr. Shabaz Farooq. Dr. Shabaz Farooq is a uh, is a very young doctor and he is uh, he is the speaker for today also. So he. consultation with the patient also but i want to know before taking any uh, other uh, questions i will just uh, ask him to just give a brief uh, 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 brief uh, picture about the how we looking in the being an insider in the hospital and how, what are the situation how they are dealing with those about the people those who are coming in they are not getting the bed they are not getting the oxygen even the other side if you see about the doctors doctors are working for 36 hours 40 hours in one stretch how they are dealing with those situations so these are the things that we have to understand with the both side it's not about the single side that you are uh, talking about the government or the patients and uh, we have to think about the doctors mental health as well they are going into depression there are more than a, uh, 100 only in delhi where doctors have died in this last 3 months so you can imagine in one state there are if 100 people 100 doctors died de- de- due to covid So what are the situation in whole country? You can imagine. It's I think around more than 500. We have uh, the data, official data that doctors have lost their lives due to COVID, uh, treating the COVID patients. 
so what is the situation dr saba is that i would like to request you to just have your insights you know that people can understand with your perspective yeah can you hear me yes yes we can hear you dr can you hear me yes yes yeah. we can hear you yeah the, this is happening because uh, uh, because of uh, lots of uh, patients uh, are coming uh, positive and uh, uh, there are, are bad, loss of uh, beds in our hospitals uh, this is happening there for that reason and uh, uh, you know that uh, in india there is lot of uh, 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 less doctors in our india that's why this is uh, hurdle is coming to toward the doctors uh, and the doctors are uh, feeling very stress in this time so uh, i think uh, i think patient hello i think yeah i think uh, uh, this can be tackled only uh, on the uh, preventive side if if we uh, prevent it this uh, situation if we wear proper mask and uh, we uh, uh, do the uh, proper distancing we make proper distancing so uh, by this uh, we can tackle uh, this problem uh, uh, dr archana is uh, there she put the question that uh, uh, prevention is better than cure i think uh, that is a, a very uh, good suggestion we can tackle by this and uh, other uh, prevention is that we can uh, we can be vaccinated yeah doctor doctor i just wanted to know that you know in the hospital that dealing with the patients how how many hours the doctors are uh, giving putting themselves in a hospital and how they are dealing with the uh, this kind of stress how they are coming out of the because it's not just one day two day one week it's mm. continuous like month after month month after month said they are into a stress so how they are dealing with yeah. this and how they uh, other uh, things that to do that they can overcome this kind of uh, there we have seen lots of videos in from maharashtra that the doctors were crying on the on live that you know they were not able to, uh, uh, means like emotionally they were washed out you know and they, this was very difficult situation for them as well so how they are dealing with this can you explain those scenario because we are outside uh, we don't know the situation inside yeah. hospital uh, dr khushid uh, this is happening because uh, of lack of doctors in uh, india a uh, 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 one a doctor which, who is uh, uh, doing who, who was doing 6 hours duty in a day now he is doing a 12 hour uh, in some areas uh, he is doing 24 hours duty in icu itself that's why they are uh, there that's why they are very stress in this condition uh, it, even in a, a icu uh, only uh, in some states in icu only one doctor is available and uh, there are uh, lots of uh, patients uh, in the icu and uh, also uh, icu if uh, it is a 15 bedded icu they have increased double 13 beds uh, 13 patients so they are uh, doctors are actually feeling very stressful they are uh, uh they cannot uh, they are uh, cannot uh, they cannot control their emotions some doctors uh, i have read uh, on uh, social media they they are crying after seeing the situations of the patients they are crying very and some doc uh, my friends are uh, very uh, stressed in this covid condition i, I i uh, already told that uh, uh, we have to uh, we have to tackle on the uh, 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 ground level that is the prevention prevention can be uh, 
tackled by uh, taking vaccines and uh, it can be tackled by uh, taking uh, proper precautions like uh, masking and uh, making some distance uh, which is uh, six feet about so, uh, so Dr. Farid, thank you so much. Uh, there are many questions and many curiosity about the black fungus and um, yeah. and the, the, yeah. the, uh, my question. Dr. Rachita uh, would like to just highlight those points. I request you, Dr. Rachita, if you can explain those things and the precaution and the people can understand very well uh, with the, uh, your perspective. So, I would welcome you for there. Uh, greetings, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah, if you switch on your video, then it will be very yes. good. Am I audible? Yes, yeah, Dr. Rachita, yes. So, um, I have like heard many people, they are very curious to know about mucormycosis, which is uh, the black fungus and white fungus. So mucormycosis, it's actually a complication which is uh, uh, generally present in the uh, COVID patients. It is a complication caused by a fungal infection. And uh, people, they uh, catch it by uh, coming in contact with the fungal spores, uh, which is either through their respiratory tract or through the skin. Like if they have any scratch over, if there is any uh, breakage in the skin lining, then the fungal spores can enter their skin and it may infect them. So um, actually it is, um, this fungal infection is uh, very common in people who are uh, diabetic, like generally who are diabetic patients, since they have like very high sugar levels, they have uncontrolled sugar level. So they have, um, like, they are a risk factor for developing mucormycosis. And uh, people who are uh, using steroids, they also, like, they also have uh, um, a risk of developing mucormycosis. People who are uh, comorbid, they have hypertension and other uh, comorbidities, like they are uh, some organ transplant patients who take immunosuppressive drugs to um, like they have to take immunosuppressive drugs they are also um, like they are also uh, prone to developing mucormycosis and uh, white fungus it is at why it is known as white fungus because when it infects the mucosal lining it creates a white patch over it it is like a the we say basic candida infection it creates a white patch over the mucosal lining and it is um, actually white fungus incidences are common among the young population the age group of uh, 18 to 25 years they are prone to develop white fungus and uh, the treatment for mucormycosis actually it's uh, uh, quite uh, burdensome as we require 20 vials of amphotericin B to treat white fungus, which cost a lot. So as we say, prevention is better than cure. So uh, to like, we have to uh, take appropriate measures to protect ourselves from mucor mycosis. We have to be very vigilant. And the only treatment for this is but the infected parts, they need to undergo surgical debridement. Debridement is the only treatment to um, cure it. And uh, the common symptoms like we see, there is a blackening or discoloration over the nose and uh, blurred vision, chest pain, and there are like breathing difficulties. Such things are, these are the common symptoms which are associated with the mucormycosis both black and white fungus. White fungus is, as I said, it is just like the candida infection as it forms a white coating over the mucosal membrane, the effective mucosal membrane. So Doctor, that's there, all. Yeah, Doctor, there is one question in the text board. How to uh, recover from the post-corona body complications like chest pain, blood infection, and my new digestion problem, how can I monitor my liver kidney at home for its proper working? The Priyanshu had questioned this one uh, from doctors. 
that can you elaborate that how they can understand that how their liver and kidney are functioning well and how they can do the homemade treatment something like that like uh, liver diseases yeah. first of yes yes please go ahead okay yeah, yeah carry on dr rachita ha uh -huh. liver diseases they uh, they are generally the first symptom is the uh, loss of appetite uh, like uh, um they they may notice that there are changes in their appetite and uh, to uh, have a good like liver we have to monitor our diet take uh, proper um, uh, proteins uh, consumption of uh, essential amino acids proteins is very much essential uh, and uh, for kidney diseases like you have to keep a check on the like um, urine output you have to keep a check and you have to see if you have any uh, uh, pain in the lower abdominal pain which is an indicative of the kidney infection so you have to be very careful you have to keep a check on your diet you have to be uh, properly hydrated take adequate quantity of fluids and you have to take proper rest to keep your uh, uh, the or vital organs uh, working thank you dr dr sahbaz has to answer one question uh, raised by uh, gorov so dr sahbaz please go ahead yeah Uh, actually he raised a question that uh, uh, how uh, we can uh, prescribe the drugs uh, for example uh, he was uh, saying that uh, uh, we have uh, some doctors uh, who can uh, who who know the local drugs uh, this uh, problem can be sorted out by uh, by giving uh, the by, by actually by by prescribing the uh, drug name for example uh, Uh, covid in mild uh, covid patient doctors uh, prescribing ivermectin actually in the market uh, it's uh, uh, available uh, on brand name for example uh, mectin 12 mg it is available under some brands uh, we can sort out this problem by only prescribing the drug name and uh, patients can uh, approach the medical store uh, under any uh, co any uh, company name this uh, problem can be sort out yeah so that that means like uh, that. some yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i just want to elaborate because you know in a common language that people may not understand that drug name and the brand name something like that so i just elaborate here because if somebody yeah. wants to get some kind of medicine the doctor has prescribed the, the same salt and same composition of that drug or medicine can be found right. with many names with the many companies so you don't have to stick to the name of the tablet to stick to the uh, composition and the salt of those medicines so that we can uh, overcome those kind of burden you know just one one medicine or one company or one brand so we can have lots of options in the villages people doesn't know that how to if this doctor has written something uh, this uh, tablet you have to take and they they don't even bother to check that what salt is available in that and what composition is there to with the same name uh, which is available mm. local level, local shop so these are the you have to understand very well you know to a small small yeah so uh, i think uh, that's uh, the point i wanted to make is that to uh, give both the names of the salt okay, as well sir. as the commonly available okay, okay. so that uh, it's easy for let's say lesser educated uh, folk to also go to the local store and say either this or this or this with the salt is i mean that is just a difference in my small difference in approach that uh, that is what i wanted to mention but i think you were saying alluding to the same thing uh, that the salt name is important often times uh, the uh, yes if you just give a drug name and the salt name is missing or vice versa that that might create uh, sort of confusion in the minds of the customer mm. or the patient uh, oh, right mm. yeah so is yeah. there a uh, please doctor go ahead 
Yeah, uh, someone has raised a question uh, that uh, can we take a vaccine after COVID infection? If uh, once we infected with uh, COVID infection, COVID virus, coronavirus infection, uh, we, we cannot uh, take a vaccine uh, after uh, two, three days. Uh, ICMR has uh, uh, given us instructions that uh, if a person has infected once, he can uh, take vaccine after three months. Okay, one well, another question is that why people are being infected with COVID even after taking vaccines? So that is the very valid question, you know, that people, if they take vaccines, also they are being COVID positive. So why, why it is so? Is this vaccine just for the name of the vaccine? for the sake of the vaccine or it is really working in the body or there are only after two doses only it's a good question so that is also maybe the symptom you know that the criteria yeah. of the it's yeah it's a, actually it's a good question uh, vaccine actually vaccine cannot uh, prevent you from uh, uh, infecting the uh, covid 19 virus uh, it just uh, prevent uh, prevent you uh, the worsening of the disease. It's uh, like if, uh, for example, uh, 15 days back, uh, I was uh, uh, infected. I, I am actually, I am uh, uh, vaccinated. I, from 15 days back, uh, I infected uh, by COVID virus, uh, but the symptoms came was uh, uh, mild. I got a mild fever and uh, anosmia. Further, I didn't uh, have, in, uh, have any severity. So um, my answer is uh, that the vaccine will only prevent you from getting any severity. So uh, Dr. Alam wants to uh, highlight something from his point of view. So, Dr. Pushit Alam, please. Please unmute yourself. Sorry, yeah. I, I was just going to say that question has already been very well answered by Dr. Shoral. Uh, that uh, this is a myth that people think that once you have a vaccine, you will not be infected. That is nothing like that. What doctor had just said is 100% true. It only prevents you from getting your condition worse. So it prevents you from, well, uh, you will have a mild symptom and you will get you get better uh, very soon. So it means you, you will not probably require any hospital treatment at all, uh, apart from your injury. So that has been answered. So I had raised hands before that. So it's not, uh, there's nothing more to add. Is that okay, doctor? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prashid. And a few more hands we can see that uh, are, these, are these for the questions or something to add values? Noor Alam, Noor Alam, do you have any question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I have one question. If a COVID a dead body uh, live in, in a river, mm -hmm. then it is uh, eaten by fish or yeah, any uh, birds. It is, uh, uh, it is for spread COVID-19 virus or not, sir? Okay, so I'll just put in another way that, you know, how we have seen in the news, you know, the lots of dead bodies in the river that we have been seen, it is very horrible situation. So he is afraid that, you know, will this create a, a spread, another a crisis by spreading the virus all over through the river and through the water or the fishes eating the dead bodies and all. So this is the very valid question that people, everybody has in mind that in future, how it is going to shape up, how it is going to affect each and each one of us. So doctor, that can you highlight any doctor, those who are here, they can, uh, highlight this issue, please. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, no uh, such any research which says that uh, 
after uh, getting uh, if uh, fishes or uh, some birds eat a dead body who is who was covid positive uh, eats uh, him uh, he he will be covid uh, positive there is no such research right now we says that uh, a bird or, or an animal uh, will be effect, uh, will be infected by covid uh, virus okay another question that uh, we have uh, from manne shrisha that uh, after recovering from the covid after 3 month due to immunity lack of uh, less immunity power is this true that uh, uh, we can get infected again or there is no chance to get the covid infection again once you are infected first time yeah might be if uh, a person having a low immunity he, if he come in contact with the virus he can in he can be infected again but he is if he is having a, a good amount of antibodies in his body he cannot be infected again antibodies uh, will kill the virus yeah so uh, i would like to request uh, dr rachita and dr shabaz can you put down the basic medicine you know when you have the mild medicine with the salt name in the chat box everybody can have that kind yeah. of name you know easily they can trace it out in the local shop and all so that will be helpful for everybody they can keep in their mobile and have it you know as a first precautionary measure that when they are feeling this kind of symptom they will check this kind of salts in the chemist shop in the local area so that will help so i'll just request the put in the chat box the two three names of the medicine with the salt so people can copy it from you okay okay i will put yeah yeah so you it can carry on so in the meanwhile okay. meanwhile i just Uh, take some uh, uh, more uh, advice for Ariella because she is willing to ha- highlight some uh, other perspective that how to take the precaution for the child and uh, other perspective. So I'd like to invite again Dr. Ariella if she can uh, just give the, some valuable inputs for, uh, with the perspective that how they can be uh, protected in this kind of situation. Thank you so much for for giving me the opportunity. Um I work with children and youth literally on a daily basis and um children and youth have been very much affected by COVID. I think that many of us don't even realize that even very young children have an idea that there's something very different and if not wrong but they that the world has somehow moved off its axis. Um I think so I'd like to give a little bit about the emotional and psychological and talk about the physical if that's okay. So for the emotional and psychological I think it's extremely important for um family members adults whatever it is to be very honest but to do it on an age appropriate level um depending on how much they understand that there's a bug or this this bug or this virus is something that makes people sick. I think it's really important to be direct and to be very honest with our children and being honest with them and they don't make up things in their head that are much worse than what they see not that what's happening is not bad but they need to have a context for it they need to understand what's happening um, it's really also important to look at whether or not they're having problems with eating and sleeping and so on and so forth having nightmares um many people think that it's better to say nothing and then they feel better but that's not the case it's really important that children and young people feel like they're part of the thing and all they can the solution process so including um hands you know making sure that their hands are are uh cleaned or washed and um wearing masks um this idea of social distancing i understand that many people believe in that i do it because we're asked to do it but i'm going to say again that the scientists have made it clear uh even the world health organization now after having covid for over a year year and a half we now understand that it's by droplets in the air um that's absolute so it's also important to let children and and, and young people understand that if someone in a family does get it 
or even if they get it, that it's not their fault and they didn't do something wrong. Um, in terms of the, um, I think the medical doctors can answer more of this, even though I do public health, but I do work a lot with children when it comes to this issue, is that children in general have not necessarily had the same effect of COVID as adults, uh, those with comorbidities, which means that those that have other diseases and also older people. We don't understand the mechanism of why that is so, but we do understand that in terms of the numbers, it is so. There are young people and children that are um, that do get COVID. They have symptoms. There are some that even have very dire symptoms and have passed away from COVID, but even those are quite rare compared to the uh, average population. Um, in general, I've seen that children become extremely afraid of going outside, it's thinking that somehow breathing the air is going to give them COVID. And that's another reason why it's very important to speak to them honestly, openly, directly, and have them help. Uh, for example, you have these masks that are for whatever color, you can have them color the masks. Um, you have to, in any way you can, have them participate in trying to uh, stop the virus or trying to make sure that the virus is spread. Once they feel like they have a possibility to, to talk about how they feel or about what they think, or even more importantly, to do something, whether it was with the mask or, or um, you know, uh, helping people to, to um, cleanse their hands, it'll change their entire perspective because you'll have a child going from fearful, feeling like they, feeling like they have no control and that the world has just um, closed in on them to a young person or a child who feels, well, I can do something. I can color my mask and wear my mask, or I can help to wash hands, or I can help in various ways. So um, that's very important. I'd like to also talk about seniors very quickly, because I saw somebody put in the chat about seniors. Um, my two hearts are young people and seniors. Uh, so for seniors, as you know, th this is a lot more complicated because they have uh, many different issues, some of them extremely um, uh, extremely healthy, but many have other diseases, I think that the doctors have spoken about. So I think, especially with older people, um, one thing that we've done in our family, I think it's really important to limit the, how many people and how many types of people come from outside your house into the house and also limit the contact as much as you possibly can um, with the older person that's in the home, but they have two, three, four, it doesn't really matter, and those from the outside. And that's going to help um, to limit some of the COVID. In general, um, I think for older people, more isolation is more recommended than less isolation until the, the virus is, is down a bit. And um, everybody can go to their own doctors and go by what they think about whether or not to take the vaccine. Everybody has different opinions on that. Um, so I don't really have an opinion on that. I just know that uh, older people do need some special care and perhaps also um, some special vitamins. Um, you know, we, one thing that we haven't talked about, and I'm not, not sure if I'm going to say this right, Ayurvedic, or Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, India is a country in the world that has some of the best medicine and medical systems in the world that most of us follow. I think that even with um, these ideas of having vitamins and lacks of vitamins and um, other lacks within the system, nutritional lacks as a result of COVID or result of the body being kind of run down. I think that um, if people within India can look back to and use uh, systems that have been in place for thousands of years, I think they're going to be, you're all going to be very surprised, and even people outside of India, that this is going to be quite helpful in responding to the COVID crisis. So um, I hope I was able to um, give a little more of understanding for that. And uh, if anyone's interested, we've had young people all over the world write about their views about COVID um, through AFI Changemakers with Ariel Foundation. So just go online. You can look up that publication and see and hear what young people have to say about COVID, people under 18. So thank you for allowing me to respond. So Ariel from Bangladesh, uh, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, uh, he has asked one question that how the psychological trauma can be managed during the unprecedented tough time that that is question for you that through facebook somebody had questioned on the facebook thank you um i i think that all of us are traumatized the, the trauma has not passed 
one single person. Because if we're not experiencing our family or with our friends, with our colleagues, we see it, we hear it, we're a part of it. All of us all around the world have had to try to figure out what's happening, how do we deal with it, and, and how do we find normalcy or something that we can hold on to in this very difficult time. Um, I think the first thing to do is to recognize those thoughts, to recognize those feelings. It's extremely important not to push them and say, oh, it doesn't really matter. It's not a big deal. Um, courage is important, but also making sure that you understand your limitations is important. It's very important if you don't, you don't necessarily have to quote unquote speak about it. I think that's the Western's idea, but it's really important to understand um, what's happening. It's, um, it's really an, important to learn as much as you can going too much into so much social media that your world is just developed in social media. Spend time with families as much as you can. When you can connect to people that are really important to you. And also when it looks like there's no hope and tomorrow's not coming, figure out a way to make one single plan, just one plan of what you're going to do in the future. That could be tomorrow, that could be next week, with a family member, with a loved one, um, if taking out your children. It's so important that we as human beings hold on to what makes us human. And that's being with each other, um, the feelings that we get from each other, and also um, the comfort we get from each other. So I think trauma can be dealt with very easily by going back to our humanity. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Riala. There is one another for Dr. Archana Asthana. Dr. Archana, can you answer the Nasreen's questions that uh, she is uh, asking, especially for Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Can you switch on the videos that we can uh, see you live? Hello. Uh, yes, Dr. Archana. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so happy that you gave me this chance. Uh, somebody <laughs> asked that why is uh, black fungus related to COVID? So people are basically being treated on steroids in COVID. And black fungus is an opportunistic, uh, uh, opportunistic uh, disease. So what steroids is doing is kind of immunosuppressing the body. So the black fungus is taking its opportunity and infecting them. And basically people with, as my colleague said, Rachita, that uh, diabetic patients with uncontrolled sugar, they have a very high chance of getting this black fungus. And also someone in the uh, box has asked that, uh, what was the question? Uh, uh, where did it go? Oh, Lord. Also, I would like to uh, say one or two things about mental health also, please, if you would allow me. Hello? Please. Please yeah. Over. Yeah, the thing is that uh, I know this is very hard time for all over the world and India being a third world country is the worst, of, is, we get it worse than the rest of the world. It's very true. We lack infrastructure, we lack medicines, we lack so many things, but rather than criticizing at this very important moment, we should stand together, we should help each other out. And not only the patient who gets COVID are depressed or anxious, the doctors who are overworked, they're also depressed. So it's very important to take care of your mental health as well right now. So please eat good, take proper, proper precautions, and please don't feel helpless. Uh, people think that doctors are uh, just like that. They don't care if a patient dies. We, we care. It affects us. It does. Mental health is important. So take care of yourself and people around you. Also, the people who take care of their COVID patients, they need to uh, take care of their mental health. Uh, because my father got COVID and I panicked. So I know how it feels like. So this is what I wanted to say. Thank you for letting me in. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, one another simple question, Gyan Jyoti Nath has asked that what I should eat during the uh, COVID infection when I, uh, I yeah. mean, what should I have the diet? What kind of diet they should have? So diet, COVID or not COVID, your diet should always be proper. Eat the rainbow colors always, like whatever colorful vegetables you see, green, like spinach, Carrots, always important. Build your immunity, take vitamins. Proper supplementation of vitamins is very crucial. Right now, we suggest protein diet. We, you should take care of your protein intake and we should. Uh, you should also concentrate on uh, proper hydration of your body. Proper steam inhalation, very important. So 
the the one good thing about indian food is our spices so please don't think they are just for show you should take them haldi is a huge antibiotic and you should always uh, be thankful that we have a diet so great actually so this is my uh, advice yeah I, uh, dr astana one more question that if somebody some uh, someone is pregnant and being in uh, and is infected with the covid in that case what are the precautions what are the diets should be necessary there are questions in on facebook that i just saw there can you answer okay. to those so if a person is pregnant first of all don't panic it's not necessary that the kid will also and when you go for delivery i'm pretty sure the uh, the precautions will be well taken the diet should be well maintained like whatever you have been suggested to eat during your pregnancy by your gynecologist before also i'm pretty sure the the like they would have suggested you taking fish and all you should continue that and tra- take proper food because you are pregnant your body is having two li- uh, two life forms supporting two life forms so proper protein intake and proper uh, supplementation with vitamins and all is very important and no need to panicking in the end i would just like to say one thing be alert not anxious just be alert okay one more question is there but i don't know which uh, uh, it's open for all the doctors i'll just paste it here but it's a very technical question you know uh, you might be knowing about the virus and genome somebody has asked there i have pasted in the chat box is in the fact that vaccines are rna with the presence of hiv genome in it isn't that the risk of immune system later on won't be we develop more disease from these vaccines so this is a very very scientific question and rna and uh, hiv genomes so doctors those who can take this question i will be very happy to just because somebody has uh, uh, messaged me through whatsapp that can you ask this question to the doctors it's open for all the doctors that how to take it up Can can I give a very general answer to this? Um, I've worked with I was I was an HIV expert for thirty years. Yes, uh, when please. We started in nineteen eighty two with RNA. And that was the first time we saw um, this replication of RNA. So um, let me say this about the vaccines. And um, my first PhD is in international drug policy. So and that's a medicine. Medicine. So I'm saying this from a perspective of uh, education and also from experience. um i think that when we look at right now the uh vaccines that we're getting i think that it's really important for people to know and understand and as the, as our physicians have said is that the vaccine itself does not necessarily stop you from getting the covid virus let's start with that um the vaccine is unusual in that or the vaccine so we're talking about all of the vaccines from the various countries um and various companies are unusual and that they use rna technology rather than the technology used before it is a different technology that um signals to the body to actually turn on a replication in order to respond to a disease so this is unusual a third i'd like to say is that right now when everybody had, takes the vaccine all over the world we are all enrolled in a two year um let's say study um and it's not a necessarily a bad thing but it's a it's a two year research study to figure out how does your body respond um what's the best way and even now i think all of you heard that one of the uh pharmaceutical companies i don't want to name which because i don't want to have any difficulty and backlash has now said oh yes well we even think you need a booster and this is after two vaccines so i think that everybody should be aware of that um vaccines that have come pretty quickly are vaccines that many people would like to take people should take them with choice they should take them with information and and also they should understand that um we really don't know what these vaccines will do in the future and um not to say that anybody shouldn't take them so but just please understand that this is new for all of us and the truth is is that we will learn more as time goes on but we don't know as much as we will in the future and it was the same for htlv3 which was the human t lymphovirus 3 now called hiv and aids we had the same issues in the same situation so um i don't think any of us really understand where exactly this is going to go and how well one vaccine 
patent will work opposed to another. And the question about RNA and can this turn on other diseases? Um, it's possible. And we've seen this with some of the vaccines. Uh, does that mean that they're not safe? I don't know. Does that mean that you shouldn't take them? I don't know. I think it's up to each individual and it's up to those who work with your, your um, healthcare professionals to decide what's all best for you. But all of us have to answer what's best for ourselves and what's best for our families. Because right now the truth is we all don't know. And um, I would say within two or three years, even four or five years, we'll have a better understanding of what the virus vaccine has done and whether or not it will help to uh, help in the future of not getting COVID or whether or not it will also be um, changed. The vaccine will be changed in one way or another. It, it, it's, it's still out for, for uh, debate and it's out for knowledge. We just don't know. Thank you, Dr. Riala. Uh, hope that uh, that question is answered uh, uh, for that. And now I'll just request uh, any doctor that give the uh, very, uh, I just want to view those who are in the rural areas, some any suggestion as, they, as you have been uh, advocating that prevention is better than cure. So uh, can you suggest the, in a very uh, simple way that how people, those who are still uh, healthy and they are not uh, they have been not infected and how they should take precaution when there is a community spread, especially in the rural area where there is no healthcare facility. How should they, because medicines and drugs are uh, the things required later on when you are infected or when you have the symptoms. But when you don't have the symptoms, what are the basic things that uh, a part of the food habit to change or food habits to continue? What are the other ways that, you know, we have to take care of? So, Dr. Shabazz, that if you give a very brief overview that, you know, in a, for a general people, because many general people, they are uh, watching on the Facebook and also joined here. So, they are expecting something very uh, not scientific, just in a daily life that what they're using. So, they want to hear that, uh, that thing that, you know, they can adopt that simply and without any hassle. I think you should unmute, unmute, please, doctor, you are on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, I was saying that uh, uh, we can uh, prevent this by wearing a proper mask. Uh, if it is provided uh, uh, in villages, uh, it is provided with a surgical mask or if a surgical mask is not uh, available, uh, we can use a uh, uh, the proper cloth mask, but uh, as uh, Dr. Ariella uh, said earlier that uh, it's uh, an aerosol uh, disease, uh, we, we have to, uh, actually we have to wear, if we are using a cloth mask, we have to wear uh, two cloth masks mask, and uh, with the proper social distancing, we can tackle this uh, problem. And in villages, uh, actually, the main, uh, mainly we have to uh, educate the villagers. We, uh, we have to do this. Yeah, Dr. Shai. Basically, you want to say that awareness is more important than any other thing that awareness education that is really very important in this uh, in this very difficult yeah. time but uh, as we also mentioned that uh, the technology and the internet penetration that is really very difficult in the rural area that is another challenge that we have to overcome so these are the things that we have to uh, understand within the very lim limited resources how we can handle this situation not easy it's not just a difficult task it's like very much you know, Herculean task, you can say. So this is all about that, what we heard. So any question that I, it's open forum that anybody uh, uh, would like to have any other questions. So we can take in the last uh, few minutes. And after that, we can just go for the closing remarks and the, uh, any consultation, those who are any COVID patient, they also want to have some kind of direct consultation. We uh, will, we will 
welcome and open the forum for the doctors as well. Doctor Shahid, are you asking me? No, no. I am just. It's open question that I'm just asking anybody that who wants to share anything or any question last in the last minutes. So, but one one colleague and one of the participants from the uh, Bangladesh that he had joined and he li would like to focus on abstaining from the smoking during the tough time. So I would invite uh, uh, Brother Suvan from Bangladesh that uh, he can highlight some of the aspects that he is. He is also scientist and he is also researcher in the health sector and with John Hopkins and other institutes, very uh, big institute. So I'd like to invite him to just highlight those points that we have not touched yet. So it will be very beneficial for the others, those who are uh, addicted to smoking or anything that, you know, that will help them to uh, get an idea to how to con uh, protect themselves. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shahid Siddiqui, and uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Ariel, as well, uh, because uh, she has invited me in this program. Uh, so, uh, as I am a uh, researcher and very inclined to the tobacco control research, uh, uh, the WHO and the CDC uh, they uh, recommend the, uh, to abstain from smoking in this uh, tough time because, uh, as uh, it, it causes uh, pneumonia and uh, distress in the lung. So uh, those who are smoker, uh, they are more prone to have uh, COVID infections. And uh, in in countries like us, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, there is a uh, common practice that we uh, share our cigarettes or berries with our other colleagues or friends. So in this way, the COVID infection uh, can rapidly uh, transmit from one person to another. Uh, and uh, during uh, this time, in, in many of the countries, uh, the smoking cessation program was emphasized and um, the direct uh, marketing of uh, tobacco products was also uh, uh, stopped by the government. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a very short, very, very valuable inputs. You know, it's a, we never thought about it that, you know, the scenario that in the rural areas, it's very common that uh, people share their cigarettes and BDs, you know, among each other without taking care of this kind of infection spread and all. So it's very good suggestion from you. Thank you so much for joining from Bangladesh. And now I'll just uh, ask Dr. Ariel. Now, again, we are coming at the closing remark and we'll request Dr. Ariel to highlight and they put the closing remark that how we it is beneficial and how we are going to go ahead before that i'll just uh, add here because as it's a closing remark that i'll this is no this is the first uh, program bringing all doctors and the patients and the common men together because we have been working on the rural areas uh, we, for for health common people there is very less resource in the healthcare uh, uh, healthcare side you know so it's we are bridging those with the technology and all so we'll do this kind of programs more often bring all the exports from across the globe and uh, for at the doorstep of the villagers those who are suffering and may not be uh, exposed to this kind of knowledge and information and all so we'll create a very close group those who are very very active in the health sector will bring all together we'll try to take their valuable time at least half an hour one hour or two hour maximum to just add value and this will be this is being recorded and it will be, it will be available online for uh, viewing again and again for others those who want information such information such uh, suggestions so that will be available and we will again connect with the different uh, platform and thank you so much doctors young doctors experts from across the globe and especially dr ariala and the doctors those who are here uh, prescribing others uh, suggestion as well as the experiences so we uh, wish you all the best in your career as well as for the support to the people those who are not having that kind of exposure at least in india so thank you so much i'll i'll just hand over to dr ayala for the closing emails thank you so much I, i'd like to thank all of those who participated that's those who have not spoken those who have just been with us for the last two hours um, those experts, the health experts, uh, those who are experts in what it's like to have COVID. And um, also I'd like to thank 
specifically Doctors Without Borders and all of you living in rural areas. I'd like to say that today we had the chance to actually be together, to learn with one another, and to try to figure out how to make this very, very difficult and um, nightmarish COVID experience within India something that we can tackle together. Please remember, it's really important, and this includes all the health professionals to look at your mental health, to take care of yourself, um, also, diet is extremely important, hydrating, drinking lots of water, taking vitamins when you can, sleeping when you can. If you have to take a good cry, if you have to shout or bang something, please do that. Make sure that you're able to express the feelings that you have so you can keep going. And I just also want to say that for everybody in India, for the entire population, everyone in the world stands with you. We are with you. You are not alone. We have been with you and we will continue to be with you. We want you to know that you have had the second wave, but it's likely to go to other countries. And because of what you've done and your bravery and your courage and how you have gone through this, it will make it much better for other people in other countries to follow your example. Thank you. Thanks once again. Now yes, we'll connect again soon after some time, after 15 days, we'll have together again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.